Amen. This morning, I would like to share with you on the birthright and the blessing. The birthright and the blessing. And I just ask that you open your hearts to the Lord this morning. And my prayer, if nothing else, is that we would leave here with an understanding of what our birthright is. And the fact that the Bible says that the blessing of God is upon his people. We don't need to pursue. We don't need to pursue those things. And what the blessing is, is not the material things. It's his spirit upon the life of a person. So the birthright, what is the birthright? By definition, the birthright is a right, privilege, or possession to which a person is entitled by birth. That's the dictionary de definition. Biblical significance and definition is the birthright touches on three major things in scripture. It denotes the special privileges and advantages belonging to the firstborn son, son among the Jews. The firstborn son became the priest of the family in the stead of his father when he passed on. We see that in the life of Reuben, who was supposed to have been the firstborn and moved into the place of Jacob when Jacob passed. passed. But unfortunately, because of sin and because of him defiling his father's bed, he lost that place. He lost that place. You see that in Genesis chapter 49. That honor of the priesthood was transferred by God from Reuben to Levi. You can see that in the book of Numbers chapter 3 if you read in detail. And the firstborn son, secondly, was allotted to him. One was the priesthood and the headship of the family. Two, the firstborn son was allotted a double portion of the inheritance. So if, for example, a man's estate, if he had 12 children, he divided his estate into 13, technically, and the firstborn son got two portions of that, and everyone else got one each. That was, the, that was, the, that was what was supposed to come to the firstborn son. Again, I would use Reuben as an example. Because of his undutiful conduct, we see that he was deprived of that, of that birthright. And when Jacob was blessing Joseph's sons, he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh and actually gave to them one portion each. So technically, the double portion that should have come to Reuben was given to Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The birthright. The birthright. Lastly, about the, the Jews... The firstborn son inherited judicial authority. Judicial authority, kingship, reigning, rule, leadership of the family. That was the lot of the firstborn son. We see Jehoshaphat gave all his children in 2 Chronicles chapter 21. He gave all his children gifts. But Jehoram, who was the firstborn son, he handed the kingdom over to. It did not end at physical gifts. The firstborn son took the place of rulership, of kingship, of judicial authority. So as the firstborn, the person was had an inheritance superior to all his brethren, and he alone was a true priest. We know today who that is in our lives. It is Jesus himself. I'll go to the blessing. What is the blessing? The blessing, by definition, again, interestingly enough, in the dictionary, it says it's God's favor and protection. As simple as that. God's favor and protection. In the dictionary, also, it goes on to break it down to say a blessing is approval that allows or helps you to do something. I want you to pay attention to this because we have brought the blessing to be a tangible thing, to be cars, to be houses. It is not so. The blessing is God's approval upon your life, God's help upon your life to help you to achieve things that in yourself you could not attain. The blessing is also something that helps you or brings happiness or joy. I would like to switch around the word happiness for joy because happiness is circumstantial. But we'll see that the blessing of God upon the life of a person is not based on what happens in your life. It is God, the Spirit of God, working actively in your life. So regardless of where you find yourself, where everybody else is sad and gloomy, you just are filled with joy. And people cannot understand why are you going through what you're going through and yet you're filled with joy. The Bible says concerning Joseph that Joseph was very prosperous in prison. I don't think you and I would define that to be prosperity. But yet the Bible says he was very prosperous in prison. That is a blessing of God. So from this, it is evident that the blessing is not tangible, but the effect or byproducts of it can translate 
to tangible things that we have called the blessing. And so this is just tying into all that we've been sharing since morning about the Spirit of God. The most important thing is the Spirit of God upon the life of a man. And we're going to see today, going to the scripture, looking at Jacob and Esau. We want to get a few lessons from the life of Jacob and Esau, breaking down the birthright and the blessing. And the birthright you will see is your relationship with God. Is you being a born-again Christian. That is your birthright in Christ. And the blessing truly is you being the son, being a child of God, what benefits come from that? And so many of us today are pursuing the blessing and despising our birthright. You cannot walk in the true blessing of God if you are not his child. So it's not the blessing and then we can maybe have the birthright. But the truth is that if you walk in the reality of the birthright, the blessing will come. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom, seek the kingdom, not those other, all these things that we pursue shall be added unto us. So what we're to seek after, what we're to pursue is a relationship with God and trust God to do what he alone can do in our lives. Praise the Lord. So let's quickly look at Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, and I would start reading from verse 22. This is about Isaac and Rebekah when she was um, pregnant, carrying es um, Jacob and Esau. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. I'll read from the Amplified going forward. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth, and his hand grasped Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, the supplanter. Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a cunning and skilled hunter, a man of the outdoors, but Jacob was a plain and quiet man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved and was partial to Esau. Pay attention to that. Because he ate of Esau's game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Jacob was boiling pottage lentil stew one day when he, Esau came from the field and was faint with hunger. And Esau said to Jacob, I beg of you, let me have some of that red lentil stew to eat, for I am faint and famished. That is why his name is called Edom, bread. Jacob answered, then sell me today your birthright, the rights of a firstborn. I wanted us to see that part. Jacob is asking Esau here, sell me the rights of your firstborn. Is it Esau's to give? No. But yet Jacob was asking for it. Almost like he had been waiting for the opportunity. Almost like he had been waiting for the opportunity. He didn't hesitate. He asked for the birthright. Esau said, see here, I am at the point of death. What good can this birthright do to me? Jacob said, swear to me today that you are selling it to me. And he swore to Jacob and he sold him his birthright. Then Jacob then Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau scorned his birthright as beneath his notice. Genesis 27, let's look at verses 9 from 19. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done what you told me to do. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may proceed to bless me. So we see here where, Jake, where Isaac said he wanted to bless his sons, and he, his son, particularly Esau. Esau had gone out to, to get the game ready, and Rebecca, having heard the, her husband say that, told Jacob, you know what, quickly get ready, go and meet your father, dress like your, son, your brother, so that the, your father will bless you. Now I want us to think about this. Who did God reveal the destiny of these children to? Rebecca. Rebecca knew that God had said that Jacob would be would serve the older, would serve the, the younger one. And here we see her taking that, that situation into her hands. Did God, did God ask her for help? He didn't need her help. And this is a lesson to us. That whatever God has said to you, allow him to bring it to pass in his own way. 
So we see here, she goes on, and Jacob continues. So in verse 20, and Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found the game so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God caused it to come to me, really? But Isaac said to Jacob, come close to me, I beg of you, that I may feel you, my son, and know whether you really are my son, Esau, or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, and his father left, felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He could not identify him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. But he said, are you really my son, Esau? He answered, I am. I'm going to skip along. I won't, look, I won't read the blessing specifically. I'm going to go on to verse 30. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob was scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Esau had also prepared savory food and brought it to his father and said to him, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he replied, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled and shook violently. And he said, Who? Where is he who has hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate of it all before you came and have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with a great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me, also, O my father. Isaac said, Your brother came with crafty cunning and treacherous deceit and has taken your blessing. Esau replied, Is he not rightly named Jacob the supplanter? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not still a blessing reserved for me? This story is so rich and lots of lessons to learn from. I'll just read through a few. One, from this story, God has a predetermined purpose for your life. He had said it when Jacob and Esau were in the mother's womb. The older shall serve the younger. One shall be stronger than the other. What has God said concerning your life? God said to Jeremiah, before you were even formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I'd ordained you to be a prophet. For every one of us sitting here, we have the assurance and the confidence that God has a purpose for your life. You are not a mistake. You are not, you are not here by chance. And when he created and formed you, he had a purpose for your life. It's important for you, your responsibility is to seek the face of the Lord as to what that purpose is. If I know my purpose, I am focused in pursuing that. I'm focused, and no matter what is happening around me, it will not bother me because I know where God is taking me to. So you need to know that God has a predetermined purpose for your life. God has the final say. He is sovereign and he can do as he pleases. When you have time, read Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. You will see where God said in the book of Romans. He, he went back to talk about this story. Paul talked about this and said, God loved, God loved Jacob more than he did Esau. He said he, God, he loved Jacob and he hated Esau. And the Bible goes on to say, is there any impartiality or injustice to God? Paul said, no, there was a reason. There was a reason why he, he had already determined and knew that it would be so, that Jacob would be the one forging ahead, ahead of his brother. When you read the life of Esau, you would see that Esau was one that did not live a life that would please God. Esau married from the Canaanite women. His, his wife gave his parents a tough time. They dishonored his parents again and again and again. Esau's life did not glorify God. And, but he was the firstborn, and he took it for granted that because I'm the firstborn, these things will come to me. So when you see his life playing out, you realize that God is not to be deceived. And what you think is your right is not your right. It is still, the Bible went on in Romans to say, it is of God to show mercy to whom he will show mercy to, and compassion to whom he will show compassion to. He is sovereign, and he can do as he pleases. One thing we should learn from this is that it's important for you to know and have regard for your birthright in Christ. The Bible says Esau despised his birthright over a bowl of soup. It seems so far-fetched, but for each of us sitting here today, at different times we have despised our birthright in Christ. 
For momentary pleasures, we have despised our, our birthright in Christ. For desires, we have despised our birthright in Christ. For every time you turn your back on Jesus in any shape or form, you are despising your, birth Christ, your birthright in Christ. And that was what Esau did. And I wondered as I was pondering on this, I have a scene here. Jacob almost waiting for the opportunity. Why? Jacob knew the value of the birthright. Many of us sitting here today do not know the value of Jesus is going to the cross for us. We do not know the value of our salvation. And so we walk in defeat or we walk in such a way that almost makes him, if, if he was here, we feel bad for going to the cross for us. We don't know the value at all. But Jacob knew and he was waiting for the opportunity. The minute the opportunity presented, he moved. But look at Esau. At that point, he said, of what value, of what benefit is my birthright at this point when I'm hungry? The next thing is don't give into momentary pressures. Your giving into momentary pressures can have eternal consequences in your life. We see it in the life of Joseph. Joseph understood this. When Potiphar's wife said, lie with me, Joseph said, no. He knew who he was. He knew where he had come from. He knew where he was going to. He knew whom he was. And he said, I will not sin against my God. Now, if you were in Joseph's shoes, he had been treated so unfairly. Where he was was not where he was supposed to be. And truly, Potiphar's wife was offering him some ray of hope, if you want to call it. Because she was influential. If, she, if he pleased her physically, honestly, Potiphar's wife would have set Joseph in places he may not have gone to. But Joseph understood, my destiny is not in your hands. Number two, I, I would rather die than displease my God for a moment of pleasure. And he went to jail. His life got worse for that decision. So it seemed. You need to know that whatever you are going through today, as long as the name of the Lord is glorified in your actions and your decisions, that's all that matters. God is able to bring you through whatever you are going through. And where man sins and thinks it is glorifying, is, is a glorious thing, it doesn't mean that's how God sees it. God's definition of glory, of prosperity and blessing, and blessedness is the true definition of it. You don't need to struggle, lie or scheme for what is yours. We see Jacob do that. Did he need to do that? No. And you know, as I pondered on this, I thought to myself, Jesus said, seek my kingdom and its righteousness and everything will be added unto me. Hmm. The reason why we pursue the things we pursue is that we don't believe that word. If Rebecca believed God, who was she inquiring of? She was having issues. Who gave her the ability to bring forth? It was God. Isaac went to inquire of God. Open my wife's womb. Is it not God that answered? He did. The same God, you went back to inquire of him. Why am I having these you know, movements? Why am I uncomfortable? What is going on in my body? God answered her. That response did not come from any man. It came from God. And the Bible says the Lord answered her. So God spoke to Rebecca. But she was not content with the fact that God has spoken. Like God has spoken to us and told us, seek me. There's nothing you need that I will not take care of. But keep your gaze on me. Stop seeking my hand. Seek my face. But we don't believe him. So Rebecca began to scheme and maneuver. And that is why we know God is merciful. Because it does not negate, or it does not mean that God has condoned the wrong in what she did. And that's why we need to learn, pick from people's lives, and pick the lessons, the good things, the bad things. She didn't need to scheme the way she did. If God has said the younger will serve, the, the, the older will serve the younger, he was going to do it. How he chose to bring that to pass is his prerogative. 
You don't need to skim in your place of work. You don't need to lobby for anything. You just make sure that what you're doing is bringing glory to God. And let him guide you in what you're doing. And let him bring you to that place. You see it in the life of David. David was anointed king at 17. He did not attain the, the throne until 40. 23 years. And even when he had the opportunity to step in, he stepped, he realized, I should not. He had the opportunity to king, kill King Saul. He could have said, I'm the one who has been anointed. But what did David say? Oh, Lord, he was grieved. I should not touch the anointed. David need to wait for God's timing. He waited for time in the timing of God. He didn't try to manipulate. Even his friendship with Jonathan, where he could have taken advantage of it, he did not. It was actually Jonathan that stepped back, recognizing the hand of God and the purpose of God on his friend. Jonathan was the one that should have stepped into Saul's shoes. But Jonathan knew, ah, and stepped back and said, you are the one. You are the appointed one. But here we see Rebecca and Jacob scheming. You don't need to struggle. If you know this in your place of work, for example, when things are happening, you see people lobbying, you will just rest. When God is ready to give you a platform, oh, it will be powerful. When he did it for David, David said in Psalm 19 verse 2, he said in Psalm 17 verse 2, he said, let my sentence of vindication come from you, O God. He let God fight for him. And when God did it, he did it publicly. It was the people that came themselves and said, David, it is time. We are putting you. We are taking you and, and, and enthroning you. He did not do anything. When it was time, the platform was given to him. You cannot sell your birthright. It is not yours. So even when Jacob was asking, sell me your birthright, he was asking for something God had already done. Like for us. God has done things in your life already. All you need to do is step into it and walk into it. And we're still asking him for those things. He's done it. You cannot sell your birthright, but you can actually choose not to accept it. We see Reuben. So when you begin to walk contrary to God, those are ways in which you despise your birthright. And God is just. He is just. It is the blessing of God upon your life that matters, not what man can do. I say this because the Bible tells us there, as we read, that the father Isaac loved Esau. Again and again, Esau did things that should have upset his father. Enough for him to say, you know what, you're not serious. So if he was left to, eat to Isaac himself, Esau would have gotten that birthright regardless. It doesn't matter what man can do for you. Because truly, man can do nothing for you. All that matters is the blessing of God upon your life, the hand of God upon your life. The blessing was placed on Jacob because the birthright was his. And you see in Genesis 27, verse 36, I'll read that quickly. Esau replied, I will go to the latter part. He said, he took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. The reason why the blessing was upon Jacob was because of the birthright. We're, take, we're, make, we're taking it the other way around. We're looking for the blessing and despising the birthright. Your birthright, as I said, is your relationship with God through Christ. And that's what we should seek to pursue and protect. The blessing will come. It's a given it will come. Isaac was deceived. Galatians 6 and 7. He said, do not be deceived and deluded and misled. God will not allow himself to be snared at. We see Isaac was wondering, is this Jacob? Is this, is this sounds like Jacob? But the body, the smell, he said, come close to me. Let me smell you. That was another way of him validating, is this Esau? Because he knew Jacob was a man of the tent and he knew Esau was a man of the field. And so he knew he would smell him. But you see, Rebecca, scheming with her son, had clothed Jacob in Esau's clothes. So at that point, Isaac was confused. He had eaten and he was full. It was time to release the blessing. And he could not really. 
so even though he is God deceived, he's not. God knows the true intent of every man's heart. No matter what you do, no matter how it seems to anyone else, the Lord knows your true state of heart. He knows when you do something for him in sincerity. And I want to encourage us with this word, not to discourage us, to know that no matter how your life may seem to be playing out, and even if people are qualifying your service to him or your commitment to God, in their own understanding, forget about what anybody thinks. God knows where you are at. And he knows that if you are able to give him 10% right now, if that's where you are at, he knows. And he will receive that from you as the widow's might. Everybody looked at that woman, giving that little coin, and would have smirked at her. But Jesus said, this is the best offering. Because he knew what was in her. And so I want to encourage you with that. The Lord knows your heart. He knows your desire to do certain things for him. But he also sees the incapacity that maybe you are you're struggling in one way or the other. He can see. So don't worry about what anybody thinks. All that matters is that God knows and he sees that your intent is to worship him. Your intent is to give your all. And guess what? He doesn't stop there. He helps you. So if all you can say is ha, huh, but is in love, do it. Don't hold back the little you have, thinking it's not enough. God knows where you are. Whatever it may be, I just have a sense to stay on that this morning. Because I sense that there are people who are discouraged and thinking. And you're looking at other people that seem to be running up and down, doing so much. The grace of my life is different from the grace on your life. Where you are is not where I'm at. So don't look at me. And maybe God is actually calling me to do more. So you are thinking she's doing so much and God is looking at me and saying, so you have not started. But he's looking at me and saying, my dear daughter, I am I'm pleased with you. Don't define your life by other people. No man can reverse the blessing of God on your life. Nobody. Nobody can do that. We see that in the book of Numbers 23 verse 8. When, we're talk, when Balaam and Balak were talking, and Balak was saying to Balaam, curse the people of Israel. <laughs> Balaam said, how can I curse, the, curse those who God has not cursed? Or how can I violently denounce those the Lord has not denounced? Then in verse 20, it says, you see, I have received his command to bless Israel. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse or qualify it. Verse 23 goes on, surely, <laughs> Balaam said, surely, there is no enchantment with or against Jacob. Neither is there any divination with or against Israel. In due season and even now, it shall be said of Jacob of, and of Israel, what has God wrought? We usually use this scripture to pray when you feel something is coming against you. There's no enchantment. Let us get a bigger revelation of this word. <laughs> Let's get a deeper revelation. There is nobody that can reverse the blessing of God on your life. Amen. No matter who has spoken over you, God has the final say. As long as you are abiding in him, he would. Go back to the birthright. So don't think you can be living like a hooligan around the place and come back and stand on this word. No. It is those who are abiding in Christ that this word is relevant to. So whoever is speaking over your life, whatever situations are speaking, he said, uh-uh. If God has blessed you, that's it. The man said, he has blessed, it is done. Now think about it, going back to our story. Isaac had blessed his, so I wondered and I pondered about it. He's the father, is it not him pronouncing the blessing? So it seemed. He blessed Jacob. Then Esau came and he realized I blessed the wrong person. Should it not have been as simple to just bless Esau? That tells you that what Jacob was, what Isaac was saying over his children was not his words. It was divine. He made a declaration 
as an oracle of God over those children, based on the word that God has spoken to Rebecca. And nobody, he said, ah, I have blessed him. He is blessed. And we see the lives of these sons continue. Isaac never corrected Jacob. That's what I find interesting. If you go on to 20, chapter 28 of Genesis, you see the Bible says again, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and sent him into Laban's house. He did not reprimand Jacob once. And these are things that we should sit down and ask ourselves, why was it so? Whatever is ordained of God, no man can shake it. No man can change it. But God didn't leave Jacob there. Because you see, he was a supplanter at that point. He was doing scheming. God still had to deal with Jacob. And when you read on in the life of Jacob, continuing there on, you see his time in Laban's, in Laban's house, household was a, was a time of training. You see Jacob going to, to God at Peniel and holding on to him. And God changed his name to Israel. So where you are today is not the final destination with God. He continues to work a perfect work in you. He continues to bring you on. As long as you abide in him and you stay in him, he brings you ultimately to the place of perfection. And we see that here. The birthright, a relationship with God. We have examples of people that despise their birthright. Adam. And it was interesting, it was when Jeff was leading prayers on Friday. He talked about how in the fall, in the garden, that Adam basically gave up his birthright. Adam actually despised his birthright. And what did he do? He lost the dominion. He lost the hand of God upon his life. But we bless the Lord that the only perfect person is Jesus. He's a perfect example. He's a perfect example. People that value the birthright, we see Joseph, we see David and Jesus himself. Jesus, the birthright was his. He was the firstborn son of God. We see that in Romans 8 and 29. Jesus received the kingdom as the first son and is Lord of all. He also chose to share his kingdom with us. He shared his birthright and his inheritance, which represents a blessing. Ephesians 1. And we'll build on this particular aspect of the teaching because this is really where we are today. We learned from the lives of Isaac and um, Jacob and Esau today. We're going to build on it and drill down into Jesus being the perfect example and our birthright in Christ. But I'll leave the scriptures with you so that you can also spend time yourself. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible tells us that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. The blessing is not outside of him. A birthright in him. In verse 19, in verse 18, it says, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set-apart ones. So we see here, today, the Bible says that Jesus, we are joint heirs in Christ Jesus. Jesus gave us the opportunity and the privilege. He's the firstborn son. The birthright belongs to him. But he now gave us, the Bible says in Romans 8, that we have been adopted by the Spirit of God, that we can call him Abba Father. We have been invited and engrafted in to the kingdom of God. And Jesus did not leave us as the other children. He actually brought us alongside himself as joint heirs in Christ. And so we have the right to the birthright as a firstborn son because Jesus has given us that opportunity. He went to the cross to do that for you and I. And he goes on to say, Paul says that in the in that truth, as we live our lives daily, all spiritual blessings have been released upon us. And let us be like Jacob was when he was in Laban's house. All the different things that happened. Did you see Jacob do anything in himself? No. The way God prospered him, the way God blessed him, Joseph's wisdom when he was, when he was you know, like making the decisions over the famine and the plenteous years, was, was God. It was the wisdom of God at work in him. 
Jabez said, oh, that thou would bless me indeed. Jabez did not tell God how to bless him. He knew that everything resides in God. And he trusted that God would meet his every need. There are things that God does in your life that you did not even know to ask him for. But you're enjoying them today. So let us come to the place of trusting God to meet our needs and to lavish his love upon us. Stay connected to him like Psalm 1 and verse 3 says. He says that he be like the, like the rivers, like the trees planted along the rivers. Nothing will decay, nothing will spoil, but you prosper. Whatever you lay your hands on continues to flourish and prosper. Why? Because you're connected to the Holy Spirit. Let that be where we invest our efforts. In building our relationship, asking for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for his wisdom, for his guidance, for his teaching, for his enlargement. When you walk into a place, things begin to happen. Have you done anything yourself? No. How could it be those cattle changed and became the, 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 the fat ones and the ones that were doing well with, Joseph, with, 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 with Jacob? How? It wasn't any science. It was God. He created all things. He can turn things around for your favor. So let us begin to trust God that no matter what is happening around us, because his blessing is upon you, as he has said, those things will begin to happen around you. Even without you knowing, you will just see the effect of it. You will just realize that people come to you and ask you for questions, and he gives you wisdom, and you speak. You are in a situation at work. You are in a dilemma. He gives you a word. You do it. It doesn't make sense. And things begin to happen, and things begin to say, people say, oh, she's brilliant. No. It's the wisdom of God. It's the spirit of God at work in your life. And the more of him you allow to work in you, the more you see these things. Let's seek him. Let's pursue him. Let's be God chasers. Let our hearts yearn for him. More of you, God. Not for what we can get from him, but out of love for him, out of appreciation for him, and there's no way you can have that connection and you will not flourish in every part of your life. No way. Let us pray.